Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar, 2020 Grocery Digital Maturity Deep Dive, Commerce Leaders and Best Practices. The three-part digital benchmark webinar series is presented by Winsight Grocery Business and Incisive, along with our title sponsors, Mercatus, Flyby, and Shopper Kit. I'm John Springer, Executive Editor for Winsight Grocery, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Our speakers today are Sylvain Perrier, President and CEO of Mercatus, Jeff Baskin, Executive Vice President of Global Partnerships for Radius Networks, Steve Paro, Co-Founder and CTO of Shopper Kit, and Amar Mocha, Co-Founder and Chief Operations Officer for Incisive. I'll now turn it over to Amar, who will be kicking off to today's presentation. Please take it away. Thank you, John. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this last webinar of this three-part series around the 2020 Digital Grocery Benchmark Report. In today's session, we will do a deep dive uh, and talk about the differentiating capabilities and best practices of the top performance on the retail leaderboard. Uh, I'll just give you a, a bit of a background before we get there, right? Uh, so we work extensively on benchmarking digital capabilities of uh, global retailers across the formats. Specifically for the grocery benchmark, we assessed top 90 retailers across US, Canada, UK, and seven geographies in continental Europe. Uh, we covered capabilities extensively across the customer journey hops, I mean, covering research and discovery, ordering, fulfillment, and customer service. In addition, we enrich the observational benchmarks uh, with metrics, both financial and e-com operations like AOV, conversion, and traffic to basically arrive at relative prioritization of different digital capabilities. And lastly, and uh, most importantly, the insights from an exhaustive uh, consumer survey with over 60,000 respondents in partnership with Mercatus, for which we are very thankful to both Mercatus and uh, the retailer partners, without which uh, this would not have been possible. Uh, delving in, so, I mean, some of you have seen this, I mean, the, the reason we put it out there, so COVID basically has really recalibrated the adoption of online grocery uh, from minuscule 3.4% share to about 10% plus this year on the back of COVID. What we are projecting that the market would do to about 250 billion by 2025. And the idea of uh, putting this out there is not to put a pin on the number, so it could be 2020 or 2050, 2075 billion. Uh, the idea is to highlight that the acceleration in growth due to COVID will persist. Uh, while, I mean, you can agree that some shopper groups would go back to shopping in the stores. Uh, but in general, the adoption will grow as retailers scale their platforms, align their operating models in order to service the customers better. Uh, the evolution of capabilities on digital platform is important in order for adoption and the share of the sales to increase. Uh, at this point, I'm going to pull in my panelists and uh, you know get their perspective uh, on the implications of this digital shift and any reactions they might have to the anticipated growth trajectory. Uh, if I may, can I just start with Sylvain with this one? Yeah, sure. This is quite interesting because I, I would say pre-November, um, we were seeing a decline of roughly five to six percent on a weekly basis of the online sales numbers uh, and seeing a, a degree of individuals going back into channel uh, but what's become very interesting at the top of the month of november we're seeing a consistent surge in online sales of roughly 30 to 35 percent and that number remains fairly consistent on a week by week basis uh, and this could be due to the holidays. I, quite frankly, when I look at it geographically, it also could be related to the pandemic. And, and any perspective on the growth going forward? You see it sort of stabilizing, accelerating back up again? I, I would assume from, from what we're seeing is that number will remain fairly uh, stable and likely to increase. The reality is after four, an average of four uses online, consumers are sticking to, to e-commerce and the baskets uh, have actually grown by roughly eight to nine percent. So I see that number only increasing with time. Fantastic. Uh, Steve, Jeff, any add-ons? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll go first, Steve. Yeah, I agree with Sylvain. I think the um, I think this is going to continue to increase and 
Um, what we're seeing is the more times that that people use an e-commerce platform to order, the easier it is, and the more they're repeating as customers for that. So I think it's the the fact that they are now because of COVID um, really being almost forced to to do an e-commerce experience where they normally wouldn't. Um, they're more apt to come back and do that again because they have had, in some cases, a good experience for some retailers. Um, so I think that growth will continue. It's kind of like, you know, the first time you used Amazon, yeah, it was great. But then the second time you're like, oh my God, this is, this is really good. Um, and so you're conditioned as a customer to continue to, uh, to use that process. So yeah, I think, I think it certainly is going to stay consistent to where we're seeing the numbers today. And I, I, I would agree with this growth figure. Yeah, and I'll echo a little bit of what what Sylvain said too. Around we we were pretty much seeing the same thing prior to November. It looked like things were kind of settling. I wouldn't say settling into to pre COVID levels, but but definitely settling into a um, uh, you know a, a less madness. Um, and then immediately, you know, I, th- I think what we're looking at in the near term is a little bit of a you know, perfect storm of holidays and COVID, uh, you know, new COVID outbreaks and and new uh, lockdowns in different uh, states here in the U.S. Um, Yeah, going into 2021, especially on the heels of news of, uh, you know, several promising vaccines, you know, I I do expect that we'll probably, while the overall numbers will, will continue to stay elevated, you know, I, I do think we'll probably continue to see some of those folks, you know, falling back into uh, uh, regular in-store shopping habits, but the genie's out of the bottle, right? I mean, just anecdotally, you're talking to neighbors in my neighborhood who have, you know, always resisted shopping online, uh, th- they'll be the first to admit, you know, they, they don't see uh, any reason to go back to to the same behaviors and patterns, and you know they, they're they're kind of hooked on it, right? You you get past that that four, that magic number, and right. that's a hard habit to break. Fantastic. Okay. All right, I think so. I think we all agree that so the, the growth in the online uh, grocery sales is going to persist, right? But I think one key theme that we are emphasizing, based on what we ask our customers, is that for that to happen. Uh, the grocers need to continue to scale the capabilities on the digital platforms to meet the ever-increasing customer expectations. I mean, uh, and the reason we continue to emphasize this, and when we ask the customers, I mean, the percentage of satisfied or very satisfied customers uh, was extremely low across the customer journey hops from research discovery and fulfillment are actually the worst performers when it came to customer satisfaction. And at the onset of the pandemic, right, we saw most retailers, especially grocers, struggle to meet customer expectations. Customers could not find, um, you know, delivery or uh, curbside slots. Uh, they could not find products that they wanted. Products were getting substituted. And then, lastly, to add to the, you know, the vows of the customers, uh, they did not know if they got the wrong product, they could not return the products as well. Uh, and in our survey, we found that you know while the adoption of online grocery grew from 23% in 2018 to 44%, the loyalty to the online platform sort of stayed steady at about 24%. Uh, and that that goes back to the point that you know uh, the, this uh, online adoption at this current point uh, is very transactional, and, and people are sort of shopping uh, wherever it is easy to shop from, where they can get the demand fulfilled. Right, so. That's a sort of disconnect between the growth and what the customers are expecting. I just ask my uh, panelists on about what is their thesis uh, on consumer behavior uh, going into 2021 when it comes to you know loyalty to the digital platforms, and what are some of the implications they see uh, this sort of uh, shopping behavior thesis translate into for digital channels and platforms and their evolution. I can start with Jeff. Sure. Yeah, I think um, you know if you look at these numbers, it's, it's they're, you know they're they're really low from a customer satisfaction perspective. So I think that's what's what that's telling retailers is that you have to improve your your e-commerce capabilities. You have to improve your your fulfillment capabilities um, in order to continue that growth that we just talked about. So you have to continue that trend um, upwards. And if you look at those that have invested a lot in 
in their in their e-commerce, in their curbside, in their delivery, in their fulfillment packages, they're doing much better than other retailers. And I think what you'll find from the satisfaction scores, and I talked about this last time, is um, for those retailers that think they're doing well because they're 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 they have growth, they don't have nearly as much growth as they should have had because they're not necessarily doing a good job. So the customers that have, you know, 48% that were satisfied with online ordering, guess what? You know, the other 52% are going someplace else where they do have good online ordering or they're just not, or they're not going to use um, e-commerce. They're going to, they're going to figure something else out. So I think there's a big investment that still needs to be made, even though there's been a lot of progress, there's still a lot long way to go. Uh, Sylvain, any perspective? Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because if you look at the psyche of the consumer in in, in the current market and it being a, a pandemic market, we've seen roughly 60% of consumers kind of shift their loyalty to a different retailer. And, and you're right to point out, Amar, that it's become extremely transactional. My sense that retailers, what they need to keep in mind to kind of create this level of loyalty and stickiness that, that represents num the numbers that are better than what we're seeing today they need to be mindful of search and, and, and search in the sense that you're enabling consumers to find the products that are available in store or online. Flexibility and fulfillment, it's, it's not all about delivery. It's also about, you know, curbside uh, and click and collect and, and support and support in the sense that we're seeing an, an older consumer uh, use online more frequently today and, and I don't think our user interfaces are designed well for that consumer base. And there's these, these two additional elements. Part of my thesis is extreme frictionless and contactless. <clears throat> so if you're going to do delivery, how do you do it well in a COVID world? If you're going to do click and collect, how do you do it well in, in, in a COVID world? Th those would be uh, part of my thesis. That's it. Steve? Yeah, and I, I think... I think in many senses, a lot of retailers have, have uh, uh, due to the pandemic, have benefited from kind of a, a demand lock situation where as a consumer, um, my options may in fact be limited because everybody else is fighting for the same pickup time delivery slot uh, that I am, right? So therefore, I may, uh, I may be more tolerant of a lesser experience uh, because at the end of the day, I, I need I need my groceries, uh, and I think as we start to see the world come out of the pandemic, uh, you know these consumers are still going to be online, uh, you know at least a, a significant number of them, uh, and and then I think that is where you, different experience differentiation is going to be extremely important, right? If you're not doing it already, if you're not uh, providing a, a, an excellent online experience, uh, those consumers that you benefited from before because you had available time slots, they, they're not going to hesitate to go elsewhere. So I think that's something that everybody needs to be considering uh, in terms of how, you know, how can I maintain this level of demand as we come out of, uh, come out of the pandemic and kind of get back to life, uh, quote unquote, normal life. I think uh, I think we all agree that you know uh, the customer loyalty uh, on the online platform cannot be taken for granted, and the and the retailers sort of need to up their game on uh, deploying digital capabilities and making uh, you know the experience more seamless, more frictionless. But when we look at um, you know the customer sort of satisfaction uh, to what is actually being offered on the digital platforms uh, by grocery retailers, and we see that uh, you know as we plot the capability areas on a heat map and compare it with overall retail, we see that grocery retail in general sort of lags uh, the maturity uh, of the overall retail sector as such, right? So while investments have been made in certain pockets like uh, you know online search, uh, assortment that is available online, uh, account management and so on, uh, there still are significant opportunities uh, for deployment of enhanced capabilities uh, to drive uh, frictionless experience going forward. Right? Uh, and as uh, Steve, you emphasize the fact that you know people who've invested, and that's what our survey sort of also uh, found a strong correlation to growth 
of the digital maturity, right? People who invested early on, and if we plot the five-year kegers of these top performing retailers of the digital maturity index, they've grown at almost 2.2x. And if we sort of draw a nearer term uh, correlation and look, just compare um, the H1 uh, 2020 numbers to H1 similar period in 2019, uh, while the entire segment grew at a significantly faster pace year on year, but the people who'd invested early on or performed higher on the maturity index, they grew at almost 3x uh, the average market rate. And that gap uh, is going to continue to grow as we go along. Right. So, I mean, having set the context, now we're going to talk about, you know, as we talk through the customer journey hops, right? What are some of the differentiating capabilities uh, that retailers have deployed? And search and discovery sort of come uh, right up top, right? And here we see that it is an important top of the funnel capability, and there is a strong correlation to strong, uh, you know, search capabilities to actually driving conversion. What we've identified is that conversion percentage for customers who search for products is 33% higher than customers who just click through. Uh, while retailers have added search features and added filters, still significant investment needs to be made in making the search more intuitive and also provide more capabilities to customers like advanced filters, including dietary restrictions or ripeness, or to be able to filter fresh produce by weight, etc. We also find that you know certain other uh, elements around social media integration or even having uh, customer reviews and ratings, uh, they've not seen a significant uh, uptick when we look at, you know, the industry as a whole. And flipping over to, you know, what are some of the differentiating capabilities that uh, the top five uh, or, uh, you know, the top five ranked retailers have sort of uh, implemented? We see there are big themes around, you know, making it easy, the search function easy and getting the customer to the right answer quickly whether it is through, you know, be able to filter the products by fulfillment, availability, or dietary preferences. In certain cases, even grocery retailers like BJ's, they've implemented uh, product comparison tools where you could co uh, product compare, you know, package products uh, for, you know, function features or, you know, inclusion or exclusion of components in them. Uh, filter products uh, by availability of slots or, you know, based on inventory availability or store from which they're available from. Right. So a lot of enhancements are happening, but still there is significant room for improvement here. Right. And at this point, I would like to get the panelists' opinion on, you know, why is it that grocery retailers are finding it that much more difficult to offer best-in-class search experience when one would imagine a lot of these capabilities sort of come inbuilt into tech platform. And, and this question becomes even more important. We see that, you know, retailers or grocers who are on similar tech platforms, they have significantly different capabilities. Right? So I, I would like to get a perspective, starting with you, Sylvain, on what are some of these challenges uh, that retailers have not been able to overcome to deliver best-in-class search and uh, filtering capabilities? Yeah, great question. I, I think the, the harsh reality is product data for grocery e-commerce is, is considered an afterthought versus all the other competing priorities when you're getting a platform up and running and, and quite frankly, when you're servicing it through a pandemic. And the solution isn't as simple as saying, I will license data. Uh, and there is an ultimately a process of, you know, licensing the data, curating it, uh, ongoing curation. When I talk about ongoing curation is, is when one of your manufacturers comes with an update. How does that data get fed back into there? And how are you dealing with synonyms, spelling mistakes, uh, and updated imagery as well? So there is, you know, search is its own workflow and complements e-commerce. It shouldn't be considered as just an interaction module within the overall platform. It, it very much needs to be looked at as a separate application, much like you do with a web experience or a mobile experience. John, sorry, Jeff. Yeah, I mean, I think it's um, it's complex, right? I mean, grocery grocery stores have thousands and thousands of SKUs, some of which um, 
some of which are stocked that morning. So I think there's a big, I think the inventory piece and, and Stephen mm-hmm. Sylvain would know more about this, but um, I think the inventory piece is just complicated. It's more complicated than, than your standard retailer um, that has, you know, hundreds of SKUs on their site um, compared to thousands of SKUs in one store. So I think it's it, overall, it's complicated, which is why you need to kind of invest in, in that um, the UI and making sure that God, I'm looking for these types of apples. I need to make sure I can search for that and find them right away. Because as everyone knows in e-commerce, the more clicks, the more searches that you have to do in order to find that, the quicker people leave and exit the site. So I think that um, the search capability um, is really, really important to make sure that I can find the item that I'm looking for within a click. And if you can do that, um, the more powerful and the higher your conversion rate will be on an e-commerce site. Uh, but I do think it is, you know, I do want to state that it is, it's very complex and that's why it's really important to kind of invest in the right places and, um, and work with the right people that know this space because e-commerce for retail is much different than e-commerce for grocery. Okay. Yeah. And then I'll, 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 I'll piggyback too. again, you know, Sylvain hit it, hit it, you know, uh, hinted at, you know, it's, it's, it's a quality. A big part of this is a quality of data problem, um, and and of course every every online retailer is going to have a similar challenge. But then it's it's absolutely to Jeff's point, it's it's absolutely compounded by the fact that uh, unlike a you know top goods retailer, uh, a typical grocery store is going to have you know anywhere from eighty thousand plus SKUs uh, in in the four walls. Uh, not to mention any, uh, you know, if, they, if they're uh, employing any endless aisle strategies to their to their online programs. So um, it's it's a it's just a big problem to get your arms around, just in terms of the scale and the size of the the, the, the data demand to to really understand that data in in a meaningful way, uh, so that we can have uh, search capabilities that are are responsive. But from a consumer perspective, right? I you know. Uh, I think it should be easy, right? If I if I enter in Apple, you know, I, I should immediately see, you know, apples. I shouldn't see, you know, uh, apple scented hand wash, right? So there, there's different, you know, there's different expectations, and, and but it, it, it's it's you know, fortunately my focus is on the fulfillment side, so because yeah, search is, search is a, search is a beast. Search is a beast. I will be the first to admit. Perfect. I, I think so. I think one thing. Um, so we all sort of on the same conclusion that while it is difficult to get uh, you know to enable best in class search functionality, but the business case for investing in enhancing the search capabilities is there simply because of the fact uh, the the uh, the upside that it yields both in terms of customer stickiness uh, and the improvement in conversion that it can deliver for you. Right. So. So moving on to uh, the next segment of the functional capabilities, which is online ordering. So online ordering uh, in conjunction with fulfillment, right, in past sort of at least six months is an area which has seen the most significant investments come in, right, both in terms of uh, new technology being deployed, uh, additional function features being made available, and the overall maturity looking forward. I mean, while we saw, I mean, when we talked about customer satisfaction, this is one area uh, which uh, had the highest satisfaction amongst the other four. And just as Jeff mentioned, while it was 48%, there are still the other 52% who are not happy uh, going to go and order from some someplace else, right? So, but the big investment areas that we've seen or the biggest adoption areas that we've seen in this specific uh, sort of uh, functional sub-segment has been uh, in, you know, ability to order from a previous order. So that has seen a higher adoption rate. Uh, promotions uh, being made available uh, uh, in the cart view. We see 30 of the 90 retailers that we assessed uh, made it available. But one pet peeve which the customers had in terms of finding it very difficult to apply coupons in the checkout view, that still remains largely unaddressed. I mean, maybe it's just a function of you know, uh, grocery retailers wanted, want to make it that much harder for customers to apply coupons simply because of uh, the thin margins, right? So those are some of the areas that we've seen. And if we look at, you know, uh, the leaders in this space, uh, the major sort of differentiating capabilities that they've, uh, you know, deployed when it comes to online ordering essentially has been around, uh, you know, uh, largely around, uh, you know, fulfillment and uh, enabling different fulfillment methods, product subscriptions, uh, you know, ability to, uh, you know, product requests, ability to make requests for product selections, 
and uh, and also you know making it more federated when it comes to uh, doing product substitutions etc and also we talk about payment methods so moving on to the next and the most uh, you know uh, the area which saw the maximum activity when it came to sort of functional maturity we saw sort of the curbside adoption went in from about 20% to almost like high 80% when it came to adoption for retailers similarly alternate fulfillment methods investment in technologies like uh, geo based uh, you know solutions uh, being the most when it came to fulfillment right so three broad areas that we saw fulfillment capabilities getting augmented in basically around signaling to the shopper that we have this product available uh, or when it is coming available offering additional fulfillment methods which is both a combination of product availability delivery option and fee structures associated with them and offering visibility to order status including you know two way communication with the store or use of uh, geo location based solutions and uh, managing returns right. essentially and when we look at uh, the top 5 uh, in this space again it's mostly largely around uh, offering enhanced sort of uh, fulfillment capabilities uh, two way communication right expedited delivery and uh, so on uh, right so and, and the associated question that uh, you know uh, that i would like to ask my uh, panelists right especially uh from steven jeff sort of worked day in and day out in this fulfillment space is that any discussion of uh, functional capability or functional maturity in fulfillment uh, always flags the question of uh, profitability right so in your experience uh what happens uh, when a grocer sort of tries to scale the fulfillment capabilities exponentially over a short period of time and also what does it do to the profitability and third part what are some of the issues which are still outstanding uh, when it comes to uh, fulfillment uh, in the new sort of digital grocery paradigm we can start with you steven this one yeah sure i <clears throat> i think um my laptop here i think um some of the challenges so in, in terms of the probability right i mean the focus largely has been just around fulfillment right fulfilling the order as place uh and i think one of the big challenges that that retailers have is um it, now that the now that the consumers are not coming into the store uh how do we continue to uh encourage impulse buys right how do we you know every everybody goes to the store today with the grocery list in hand and they wind up leaving with five additional items. How do we how do we continue that trend for our online shoppers? How do we convert that into additional items in the basket? Uh and certainly we have strategies around that from 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 communication uh and, and certainly, you know, on, on arrival as well. Um but but I think I think that's because you you have a, a more or less a fixed cost in terms of your labor, right? So it's going to cost what it's going to cost to to staff and man a uh online program with with store associates to pick and, and and deliver those orders. So to claw back on that profitability piece we really need to be looking at strategies to increase that basket size and increasing that basket size through fulfillment directly uh is is a big way of 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 pulling back a lot of those dollars that that we might be losing otherwise. And and any sort of um, you know uh additional uh, functional enhancements capability areas you see that retail is investing in sure uh, you know i mean we we believe very strongly in uh enabling a direct line of communication uh from the store from the store associates and the store to the consumers um you know we feel that that is a, a, a proven and effective way of of actually increasing those basket sizes uh, you know once once a consumer knows that there's an actual person on the other end that has a name uh that's that's uh, working for them to shop their order uh you know we we see that convert actually into uh you know at least two to three items per order being added right so that that that's a you know a significant two plus 
two, two to three uh, percent increase in that overall basket size. Uh, and it's just by cultivating a relationship between the store and the consumer. And that's, you know, we, we, we think that uh, uh, today, you know, SMS text messaging is, is pretty ubiquitous. Most people that I, I, I never personally answer my phone if, if somebody calls me, but if I get a text, I respond. And, and that's proven in our experience to be extremely effective way of, of building a, a strong relationship between the store and, and the consumer and having that actually translate into uh, added product and added dollars to that final basket size. Interesting. Uh, uh, Jeff? Yeah. I think if you look at, I mean, if you look at delivery, you know, versus curbs, I think both are, both are necessities in, in, in grocery today. I think that the delivery is certainly more expensive for both the for both the grocer and the customer. So I think that's why you see, you do see the growth of curbside um, uh, accelerating much, much faster than, than delivery at this point, um, at, least, at least at this point in time. And I think that, you know, on your previous slide, it was interesting that, you know, you saw the, um, the growth of when you do a curbside pickup, I think, because that's what, what, we're, what my company is doing, but we're seeing um, the fact that I can call a number or I, I have to call a number or I have to text when I get there and I have to go through this extra motion. And Steve mentioned it earlier that the more frictionless the customer experiences, the better it's going to be and the more times I'm going to repeat. And I, I think, and then your, again, on your previous slide, you saw very little growth in adoption for when someone um, let them know that they were on their way just manually. And then also, uh, it, whether it be through the app, let them know that I'm, I'm right here without any sort of other data attached to that. So I think what a lot of retailers have done is using that location data to look at when are exactly are they going to arrive at the store and get updates along the way has been really, really helpful for a lot of these retailers, some of them on this slide and some of them, a lot of the other regional retailers that we work with that have just done a really good job of, of fulfillment for both delivery and for curbside. But by doing that, I do a couple of things. One is I have a frictionless customer experience, meaning I'm going to let you know when I'm on my way. And I'm going to put my phone away. It's in the back app is in the background and I'm done. Um, but more importantly, for the staff inside, in order to run a profitable curbside experience, I've got to be able to multitask and have efficient um, staff inside. So whether I'm walking through the grocery aisles and using a shopper kit device, potentially, um, and getting an alert that says that, hey, Sylvain's going to be here in, in five minutes, let's deprioritize the order that I'm working on. And then I'm going to run to the front staging area and being able to meet that customer at the time that they actually arrive is really, really important um, because by the time they get there, they text that I'm, um, I'm here and then you start that process. Now I'm 10 to 15 minutes later, and that's just not going to be good enough for, for the fulfillment piece um, on curbside. And also on the delivery side, I think you're looking at how can I, how can I do a better job there at communicating with the customer? Well, God, wouldn't it be great if, if I, as a customer, kind of like the Domino's pizza tracker where I can, I can look at where that delivery driver is on their journey to my house They've picked it up at the grocery store, and now they're on my way to the house. I can get those types of updates. So I think, you know, there's the, the e-commerce part that we talked about earlier is really, really important. But I think that technology around the fulfillment piece around not only picking the picking the order to be more efficient for your staff to improve profitability, but also improving the curbside and delivery experience is also really important to improve not only customer experience, but the profitability of that transaction. Sure. Great. Uh, Sylvain, your perspective. Also, in addition, if you can uh, you know, share your sort of thoughts on how do you see the uh, operating models or the labor model sort of evolve as uh, store fulfillment uh, sort of becomes increasingly uh, you know, a larger share of the uh, total order shipped? Yeah, I, I think it's a natural tendency for, for retailers when they're in a situation where you're seeing order volume. Uh, you know, significantly fluctuate in 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 the positive to want to throw labor at it, and because it's easiest, it's the easiest thing to do. You know, especially if you're not using the right technology. You know, my advice in moving forward and trying to keep something profitable. I mean, Jeff really touched on it. I think you need to step back and say, what's my operational model? What are the KPIs that I'm seeing pre-surge? And, and when you look at those those levers that you can play with, and obviously those levers are have to be tied to some some sort of a, 
ROI model, what can I do to augment and to bring in the right, pe- right partners and the right pieces of technology that are going to give me a, a smooth cadence towards maintaining or creating profitability, even with a surge? Uh, and, and is that an easy thing to do? It, it, it's not in a moment of, of sheer panic, quite frankly. I mean, I think we all have to be honest about that. But I think you have to take, retailers have to take a step back to say what's working, what's not working. And that's, that's typically the first step that I would, I would recommend. And both Steve and Jeff have the right technology to solve the majority of these problems, uh, quite frankly. And, and that's typically what I would also recommend people look at. Right. So I think, uh, so summarize, right? So while, uh, so technology investments will continue to evolve, we've talked about, you know, both uh, capabilities in the uh, ordering and fulfillment side, be it you know dual location based fulfillment or sort of two way communication, etc. I think retailers will also have to sort of work through the hoops and relook uh, their store operating models in terms to better service the customers. I mean, eventually, currently, a lot of the fulfillment is happening. Uh, uh, through sort of uh, the contactless methods, but eventually when things go back to normal, uh, the fulfillment resources would sort of compete with one another, right? So what is the split between servicing our customers coming in to, for a curbside order versus a customer who walks in, right? So retailers sort of need to rethink uh, or evolve their operating models to better support uh, the customer. So to deliver a better customer experience enabled by the right technology capabilities. All right, so uh, moving on to uh, customer engagement and service. Uh, so this space, so right, so this is one area where we've seen uh, the investment sort of lag uh, across. While retailers have largely limited themselves to investing in you know self-serve uh, activities like managing an account, adding enhanced capabilities to account management or store location and service updates, uh, they still continue to lag in loyalty management a uh, significant number of retailers actually don't really have a loyalty program in the grocery space. Uh, customer service features like chat, etc., uh, contact support, and especially return management. And returns are becoming increasingly important. I mean, at a time when 97% of the orders were, uh, you know, customers walking into the stores, we did not have such situations where, mm-hmm. you know, somebody was complaining about uh, uh, a bunch of lettuce or, or a, you know, a cabbage or something like that. But now, as uh, more and more orders are uh, getting delivered uh, to home or curbside, uh, there has been a significant uptake in uh, you know return requests or complaints about the orders. So that's one space that we've seen sort of uh, investments uh, lag, right? And even uh, and the differentiating capabilities when we talk about you know the leaders in this space has been essentially around better loyalty management, uh, offering the you know users the ability or customers the ability to redeem rewards. Uh, online, right? Having so uh, Albert Heinz has actually deployed a WhatsApp chat chat capability, uh, where people can actually you know inquire about their orders, complain about their orders, and so on. Uh, similarly, chat assistants so Google assistants have been integrated, uh, and and loyalty redemption has been made seamless. So these happen to be some of the you know key areas uh, where we've seen investment come in and uh, sort of evolve. But we will we believe that in order to offer uh, or for this uh, online share of uh, grocery market to grow, this is one area uh, where you know investment would need to scale significantly, right? So having uh, you know, and this again is one area in conjunction with fulfillment, where the discussion of uh, you know functional enhancements cannot happen in isolation of that uh, you know talk about profitability, and because it is not just about investment in the platform, there is a significant amount of investment that needs to happen in manpower, etc. So, I mean, uh, Sylvain, uh, what is your perspective on how do you see sort of grocers evolving uh, the customer experience going forward and the functional capabilities in this space? Yeah, so so it's it's interesting question because it's half technology and half policies and procedures. So uh, an example is, you know, pre-surge of the of COVID-19, uh, most most consumers, if they had a return or, or a product issue, they would overlook it or they would, next time they're close to the store, they'd bring it back in. And we've seen a lot of retailers just fail to just to say, 
hey, we don't want you coming back in the store. We, we're not going to reintroduce the product into the supply chain. Just keep it and we'll credit you. I mean, and, and that's a, a great, way, great way where policy and procedures really come into play to make it that much easier for, for consumers to, to get great support. There's also, from, from a technology perspective, how do you use your telephone staff that are supporting your stores and supporting your consumers to adapt to chat functionality, email function, uh, email support, and so on. Uh, and I think the reality is, as as e-commerce continues to grow, especially in the grocery vertical, you're going to see a a swath of consumers that are less about the norm where they can self-serve themselves, you're going to see a higher touch consumer. So a, a, an example is we've seen some of our some of our retailers have a massive increase in older consumers, uh, greater than the age of 70, wanting to call to have help building their basket because they, they don't know how to enter their credit card or they're not familiar with the search technology. So I think there isn't a one-size-fits-all answer for this. It's more from each individual retailer, depending on the market that they're in, make sure that you're leveraging your investments. And that could be email, chat, uh, and so on to be able to support those consumers. Awesome. Uh, Jeff? Yeah, I mean, the, the messaging piece is, is really, really important on, on a couple different fronts. I think initially when I'm placing the order, whether on my laptop or wherever I am at home, um, and messaging that customer again, whether it be via chat or whether it be, you know, um, information on the website, but being able to provide that information to the customer, then having the customer be able to ask questions while they're doing it and guide them through the process. Some people will be fine if your if your UI is really good, but others will need might may need a little help. And that's why I think where where the live chat process comes in. I think also via mobile, if I am doing fulfillment like curbside um, or as I'm going to the store, you know, one of the complexities of grocery is is substitutions, right? And I think that's one of the things that that you know that Sylvain and Steve deal with on a daily basis is trying to solve that problem. And as I'm going to the store, I realize that three three items that I wanted to get are not were not are not available. Um, I need to be able to communicate that to the customer uh, and ask them what I want them to do. And then more importantly, if what we're seeing also is if I'm, let's say I'm doing a curbside pickup, but God, I forgot to add milk. You know, wouldn't it be great if I could um, message the store and add that so I don't have to go in um, and still have the same experience as I am for all of the other items that I had in my basket for curbside. So I think if um, having that, some of that two-way messaging back and forth between customer and stores is, is really important to get that full experience. Right. Steve? Steve, you're on. We lost Steve, probably, right? So we'll move on in the interest of time. So I think the key message here is so here, I mean, this, uh, it's not just uh, standalone uh, functional capability augmentation, but it's, a, I mean, retailers need to solve the issues around policy plus operating model, and also sort of leverage the right investments and case by case determine which is the right area to focus on based on whatever the market constituents are or the uh, you know the mix of products that they are selling, right? So finally we've covered, uh, you know, the overall sort of the leaderboard, uh, I mean, the overall functional capabilities by each of the functional hops. And when I, when I look at the digital leaderboard, we see, uh, interesting mix of large and small retailers uh, in the mix. I mean, there are a bunch of regional retailers who like knock the uh, ball out of the park across the functional capabilities, have delivered seamless customer experience. Right, so what I would like to understand, you know, based on you know, your experience, uh, what are uh, you know, some of the, do you see that there be, going forward, a difference in approach being adopted uh, by the small and large retailers when it comes to shoring up the digital capabilities? And, and I can start with uh, you, Jeff, this one. Yeah, I think, you know, I think some of the smaller guys um, initially, um, and some of the bigger guys too, um, saw the need and and went to right, right to an instant card or, or a ship or someone like that because they could, they could solve a lot of problems really fast and easy. And I think that um, now they're looking at it and saying, okay, I, I, I want to own the customer experience. 
I want to make sure I'm the one that's responsible for taking care of my customers. I want to I have that customer data at my fingertips um, so I can present certain things to them. So, and I also think they're realizing that it might not be as, um, as expensive or as, um, as um, complicated as it may look because there are, there are, they might not have to build it in house themselves. There's plenty of companies um, that are represented on this call um, that can help them get through this and have them manage it themselves. So I think that, and you've seen a lot of a lot of those types of partners like Lowe's Foods or Giant Eagle, um, you know, Spartan National, these, these large regional, you know, grocers or even smaller regional grocers that have done a really really good job of of building out their e-commerce and building out um, and building out their fulfillment capabilities. Um, so I think a lot of them are already going in that direction. Um, and I think for those that aren't, that have not, or, or they're nervous to, to make an investment, I think you just got to look at the statistics that are in this, in this study, um, you know, to understand kind of what it's going to take over the next several years to, um, to, to get that digital maturity, um, in order to drive revenue. Fantastic. Uh, Steve, did you hear the question? Or you want me to repeat it? I know you had some audio issues. <laughs> no. Uh, yeah. Repeat one more time. Yeah, I just got back. On. Yeah. So I, think, uh, I mean, um, so when we look at the leaderboard, right? So we see an interesting mix of these large global, uh, you know, grocers like the Tesco's and so on, and then you have these uh, you know, digital retailers who really knock the ball out of the park when it comes to functional maturity across the customer journey hops, right? So going forward, uh, do you see a difference in the approach being adopted? Uh, when it comes to the evolution of the digital capabilities by these large and small grocers? Sure. Yeah. Well, obviously, the the, the leaders uh, have the benefit of dollars, right? And, and so that that's always going to uh, uh, create a, a pretty wide uh, and difficult chasm to cross. However, you know, as Frank Zappa said it best, right? Uh, necessity is the mother of invention, uh, and and there's a lot of I think the small retailers have a lot of quivers uh, or a lot of arrows in their quiver uh, at their disposal, right? There's there's a lot of technology companies that are represented here on the call that that really can can help uh, help these smaller uh, retailers uh, catch up uh, with, with with what the, what the, the big big guys are doing. Um, but then also, I think, you know, it's interesting, right? I mean, we've seen recently, you know, Walmart announcing their, their subscription model, but, you know, a lot of independent, a lot of small retailers have been doing innovative programs like subscriptions, uh, you know, offering kind of white glove concierge, offering uh, curbside well ahead of some of the, the big players as well. So the, there's definitely a path forward. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's just a matter of... Uh, uh, you know, being creative and, and really kind of focusing on uh, your market and, and understanding where you're going to spend and where you're going to get the har- highest ROI uh, on that spend in terms of uh, uh, customer uh, customer satisfaction, experience, and loyalty. Right. Sylvain, uh, in addition, if you can also uh, share your experience on how do you see the uh, one is the platform capabilities, but also from a platform evolution, you see sort of a difference in approach where, you know, the larger ones go uh, with, uh, you know, best of breed, the smaller ones go with, you know, some other model. So what, what's what's your perspective in that? Yeah, I think Jeff touched on it. I think the, the reality is you look at the large tier one retailers, you know, typically north of, you know, 10 billion in annual revenue will use their buying power to go after two styles of platforms, very monolithic, uh, big iron type of platforms. And they'll, they'll leverage, they'll leverage their internal development teams to, to prop up those platforms and extend them over time. Uh, The, the smaller retailers historically have kind of co-opted their decision-making process and control of their customer data into the hands uh, of the the marketplaces, uh, which is unfortunate. Uh, And I think they're seeing this opportunity to kind of break that cycle, go out into um, a a preferred nation of vendors that can really bring to light an interesting solution. And, and this, this, secret weapon that the smaller regional retailers have is their ability to iterate much faster and being able to test and try things that, that you alluded to, to say, hey, let's try this. If it works, great. If it, if it doesn't, 
you know, we haven't expended a tremendous amount of capital trying this. Uh, and obviously nothing iterative is ad, ad hoc in grocery retail. It's, it has to be extremely planned. So they have, again, that ability to, to be able to do that. And, and if it does, then roll it out and be successful. Uh, do you think that the regional retailers also benefit uh, by the fact that they have a relatively uh, you know, homogeneous uh, market uh, or, or customer base compared to a national player? I, yes and no, but if I look at if I look at some of our retailers that are on the East Coast, the, the reality is, you know, from state to state, it's it's a little bit different. Um, if I think if I think more, you know, if I look at your question, even for a regional retailer, California can be the West Coast can be challenging because you'll have you know the interior versus the coast. You'll have a different mindset, different style of consumer. You know, click and collect is more important parts there than delivery in, in some cases. I think if you're a national retailer, you have to take, it, I hate to say this, a very large cookie cutter approach to everything. It has to fit, but it has to fit in the business, not just with your consumers. It has to fit operationally and be sustainable. And that's difficult. Fantastic. I think, so I think uh, I just one last question. I'm going to put uh, all three of you on the spot and get your sort of uh, perspective on, you know, based on your experience and where you are at, what are the top three capabilities, solutions or functionalities uh, that the retailers need to uh, implement to be future ready? Now, I, I, I can start with you, Steve. I mean, given you had audio issues with the question before last <laughs> having audio issues here trying to find my uh find, <laughs> find my mute button. <laughs> yeah um you know i i think you know the, the, kind of going back to what i was talking about earlier right i think you know coming out of coming out of the pandemic there's going to be uh where, where retailers have benefited from having you know kind of a, a certain amount of demand because because the reality that we're in, consumers are going to be uh, far more uh, uh, open to to trying, you know, less loyal and, and more open to, to trying other services. And, and so I think, you know, really, I think retailers need to be looking at how are they going to differentiate? How are they going to um, uh, really ensure that they're providing, you know, the, the best possible experience. You know, con consumers will pay more if they think they're they're getting a, a conscientious white glove experience. I mean, we we definitely see that, or at least certain consumers will. So, you know, I, I think you know, I think retailers really need to be prioritizing. Uh, you know, how do we, you know, provide our consumers with a truly uh, best of breed experience uh, in a high touch manner. Um, uh, that that's going to you know keep keep our customers coming back and 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 not just be you know price shopping uh, and so I think you know from that you know it's communication it's uh, uh, you know search and order accuracy and and, I, and obviously uh, I think communication through through the fulfillment process I, you know I think those are things that retailers really need to be looking at. That's it. And so when your top three. Um... Yeah, I I certainly, in my mind, search is is very critical to that to that great experience. I, I think that the second one is visibility into inventory uh, is exceptionally critical, uh, especially in this day and age, uh, and that's not an easy ask of retailers and of, of system providers. Um, I think the other one for me that really stands out is. Um, really around choice of fulfillment. And like, again, I, I can't reinforce that when you have the right partners like Flyby and Shopper Kit, um, it goes a long way in making that a possibility. Great. And Jeff, your top two? Yeah, I, I agree with Sylvain. The, you know, the, I think you have to meet the customer where do they where they want to be, meaning that if I if I really want to do curbside, you got to have a really good curbside experience. If I want delivery, 
you got to have, you know, you got to do really well at that. And if I want to go into the store, you got to be really good at that. So now there's just, there's just more for these grocery retailers to think about um, and solve for. And if I can do all of them really well, I'm going to, I'm going to do really well, um, me and the the retailer. And I think it's complicated. I think that where um, previously grocers had the luxury of being able to set up a two to three year roadmap, you know, that has accelerated um, tremendously over since COVID hit. And I think that um, there's a race right now going on with, with between the big, the regionals and even the small grocers to, to grab that loyalty because I think before in grocery more than anything that you did have that loyal customer, right? You went to your neighborhood store and yeah, sometimes it was really good and sometimes it didn't, but you know what? It's right there and it's, I'm loyal to them. Um, now I think that there's, there's, there's these customers that are up, up for, up for grab. And I think the retailers that solve for those three things really, really well, um, will be able to grab a lot of market share that wasn't there before COVID. Great. This, so this was really insightful. Uh, I'll just quickly, we are almost coming to the end of this thing, so I'll just quickly summarize and then I'll hand it back to uh, John. Uh, so I, so we all agree that the growth in grocery, uh, the digital grocery has happened, uh, but shopper loyalty cannot be taken for granted. Uh, investments in digital capabilities is a must for grocers uh, going forward, but these investments in digital capabilities has, has to go hand in hand with the evolution of uh, operating models in order to deliver best-in-class customer experience. And if I may add, with an eye on profitability. Uh, with that, I hand it back to John. Well, thanks, uh, Amar. And, th- and uh, thanks all of you for a really fascinating discussion. Uh, a reminder, if uh, you can ask our speakers a question at any time using the Q&A widget on your screen. And uh, let me see if I've got a question up here. I've got one of my own, if you guys don't mind. Uh, and I know Steve, you know, referred to this earlier, um, the, this this trend among retailers to um, introduce a paid loyalty program that would, you know, include aspects such as preferred delivery and so forth. I wonder if you guys can kind of talk about, uh, you know, that trend and, you know, to the extent you could see this kind of offer being able to move the needle on a on a uh, you know, scores in, in these elements that you guys have uh, uh, t- t- studied in this in this survey. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. Um, yeah, I mean, clearly, we based on the retailers that, that we work with who, who are employing programs at like this, it, it definitely... Um, you know, there's, there's, there's clearly a, a built-in aspect of loyalty, right? If I'm paying for a service, uh, I'm, I'm going to certainly, you know, if it's a, a, a year-long subscription, I'm, I'm going to use that service. Um, and I think the retailers that are, are doing it well, you know, it, 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 open up, it opens up my order options, right? So I don't necessarily have to place minimum order sizes. Um, you know, we have preferred uh, time slots. Uh, you have you know, preferred treatment um, through the through the ordering experience um, and through the fulfillment experience as well. So it, it definitely is useful. It keeps you know we we definitely see that it keeps consumers coming back and and it and it and it seems to be very uh, popular. You know, as as our retailers will run promotions, we will definitely see surges in subscription ordering. Um, so, so there's clearly a demand and I think consumers do see the value in, in having those services. So um, I, I definitely think it's, it's a, a meaningful path forward toward, towards kind of ensuring uh, continued loyalty. Terrific. Uh, anybody else want to check in on that one or? That's okay. Um, <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what, I don't see any more questions on here, right? Uh, apparently, so uh, this concludes our webinar. Uh, as a reminder, you'll receive an email when the on-demand recording of today's event is available. And on behalf of our sponsors, Mercatus, Flyby, and Shopper Kit, thanks for joining us today, and we hope you have a great day. Thank you.